Good evening, everyone. Tonight we will be discussing one of the oldest serial killers in Texas history, the Servant Girl Annihilator, also known as the Alston Axe Murderer and the Midnight Assassin. Like, comment, subscribe for this century-old murder mystery. Let's get into it. On Christmas Eve of 1884, the city of Austin was given a less than jolly surprise as two married white women, Susan Hancock and Ellie Phillips, met their grisly ends to a mysterious murderer. The slayings were the latest and last in a series of murders that plagued the town from 1884 to 1885, a spree that was believed to be the work of a serial killer, later dubbed the Servant Girl Annihilator. Sounds similar to Jack the Ripper. Surprisingly, some Ripper sleuths believe that Jack's first victims may have been in Austin just three years prior to the famous London killings. The murders ripped a young Austin apart, causing the city's ruckus nightlife to come to a halt and servant women everywhere to keep their eyes peeled and doors locked. But perhaps most chilling is that the city's most prolific killer was never caught. Though it has never seen Ripper infamy, the Servant Girl Annihilator has been subject to many books, podcast episodes, and articles in the past, and some even falsely claim that Austin's famous moon towers were built as a result of the Midnight Murders. It's a journey to capture the hullabaloo of a murder-stricken 1880s Austin, but we'll try to give you the gist here, and let you decide whether or not you'd like to get to be the case's next Sherlock Holmes. Austin, 1845. With around 20,000 residents, mid-1800s Austin was a once tiny outlaw town that had seen enormous growth in a few short years. With a fledgling University of Texas giving the town the nickname the Athens of the South and the Texas capital just a year or two from being constructed, the town was bridging the gap between the Wild West and the post-industrial modernity. January 1st, 1885 began a year of unprecedented violence for the small city as four African-American women, a 11-year-old girl, and one African-American man, as well as two Caucasian women, were murdered by axe or knife in just under a year, and several others would be injured. Before it was even officially named, Austin was faced with one of America's first well-documented serial killings. A visiting writer dubbed the killer the Servant Girl Annihilator. The city's ragtag police force, led by a saloon-loving city marshal named Grooms Lee, fell under intense scrutiny as they scrambled to stop the unprecedented crimes. Detectives from Houston and the famous Pinkerton crew were hired to solve the mystery, and Lee hired a new chief and expanded the police force by December 1885. News of the crimes were broadcast in grisly language on the front pages of the then Austin Daily Statesman, and even the New York Times. As quickly as it had started, the Athens of the South was on the verge of collapse. Doors were locked, visitors were apprehended immediately after they entered the city, and even the city's recuse 24-hour saloons began closing at midnight. Neighbor turned against neighbor, and the city's ne'er-do-wells became some of the case's biggest suspects. According to the Statesman, May 30, 1886 edition, all these murders occurred about midnight, in a majority of instances on moonlit nights and the same mysterious and utterly impenetrable silence unbroken by the sound or cry reigned while the assassin was at his terrible work. 
some older residents began to believe that the silent murderer had supernatural powers that kept him from alerting nearby dogs. Other residents speculated that a gang of the city's most evil were behind the gruesome crimes. But with all of the crime similarities, most were convinced that a singular sinister force was behind the terror of 1885. But unbeknownst to 1885's Austinites, the killer would never strike again. Had the servant girl Annihilator been arrested, killed, or skipped town? Suspects, Ripper Theories, and the Case of the Missing Toe Austin police were given a hard task as they looked for the mystery killer, especially as eyewitnesses gave them seemingly opposite information. The mysterious killer was described as a man who was light, dark, and tan-skinned, had been seen wearing bizarre outfits, including a woman's dress, and was sometimes identified as different local delinquents, though they were never found guilty. The lovers of murder victims, including Rachel Spencer, Moses Hancock, and James Phillips, were prime suspects. Though both Spencer and Phillips had been hacked with an axe themselves, Spencer was acquitted a few days after the death of his girlfriend, Gracie Vance, and a suspect, Vance's former lover, William Brooks, was also proven innocent after a brief interrogation. Moses Hancock was unarmed in the killing of his wife, Susan, and made it difficult for pro bono lawyer John Hancock to prove him innocent. Susan was afraid of any drunk man and had even written a letter telling Moses she would leave him, though she never did. The letter was used to prove Moses' abusive drunkenness, which had escalated in the wake of Susan's death, though his 16-year-old daughter, Lena, always backed up her father. After intense family conflict during the trial, Moses was acquitted with a hung jury in 1887. A drunken, jealous James Phillips was next on the chopping block for the murder of his 17-year-old wife, Ula. James had good reason to be suspicious of his young wife, Ula, had already likely had an abortion after becoming pregnant with another man's baby and had visited an assignation house or rent-by-the-hour romance hotel owned by local prostitute May Tobin on the night of the murder. Phillips barely survived the Axeman's encounter, but he was still strongly suspected for murdering his adulterous wife and was convicted of the murder. Phillips served six months before his conviction was overturned by the Texas Court of Appeals. Soon the trial went cold, and few new theories were provided for decades, but some modern-day theorists, including former UT professor and executive researcher J.R. Galloway, have provided new insight into the centuries-old murders. The Ripper Connection in the years after the bloody year, tales of Austin's serial killer flew mostly under the radar as tales of Jack the Ripper came in London three years later. But some have given evidence that the two crimes could be connected. A Maylie Cook, perhaps named Maurice, was reported by a statesman reporter in 1888 at the Pearl House at the time of the Austin crime spree of 1885 and conveniently left in January of 1886, just after the Annihilator's last murder. The Pearl House was located just next to the neighborhood of almost all of the crimes. Perhaps, coincidentally, a Maylie Cook was named as one of the suspects in the London crimes just a few years later. Author Cheryl Harrison used a different Ripper story, a Liverpool man named James Maybrick, who Harrison says signed as Jack the Ripper and confessed to killing prostitutes in his journal, was apparently in Austin at the time of the killings. In Harrison's book, Jack the Ripper, The American Connection, she presents Maybrick's apparent diaries and finds this motive 
Maybrick had apparently seen his wife having an affair in the streets of London and periodically returned to the area to conduct murders. Maybrick's marriage would not improve. He died from poisoning, likely from his wife, after both crime sprees had ended in 1889. The Case of the Missing Toes The Midnight Austin Assassin had a damning detail unknown to the public. He often went barefoot, and bloody footprints were often found at the scene of the crime. Interestingly, he appeared to be missing a toe on his right foot, and perhaps more interestingly, two possible culprits were found that fit the profile. The first suspect was Alex Mack, a local troublemaker who happened to be missing the same toe. Mack was attacked by detectives and officers who tied a noose around his neck outside of a bar one day. A local patron intervened last minute and stopped the potential lynching, but Mack was then beaten for nine days during police questioning. He was never tried or convicted for the crime. But just after the final murders of Christmas Eve occurred, a new possible culprit emerged, a young man named Nathan Eugene. Eugene made the papers in February 1885 after drunkenly dragging a woman from a bar to his brother's house nearby, where he subsequently beat and berated her. A local policeman, saloon keeper, and neighbor put a stop to the attack, but Elgin resisted arrest and brandished a knife before he was shot. Elgin died the following day, and the servant girl murders never occurred again. Galloway paints a damning picture in his criminology of Elgin. A later plaster of his foot matched the missing toad killer, and several other bits of evidence including Elgin's criminal past, his history of living with servant women, and his knowledge of the neighborhoods in the murder all contribute to a possible culprit for the infamous murders. In the end, the murderer was never truly found. All we know is the deaths. Molly Smith, 25, was murdered the night of the 30th December 1884. Walter Spencer was seriously wounded. Clara Strand and Christine Martyrson Two Swedish servant girls were seriously wounded the night of March 19th, 1885. Eliza Shelley was murdered the night of May 6th, 1885. Irene Cross murdered by a man with a knife on the night of 22 May, 1885. Clara Dick was seriously wounded in August, 1885. Mary Ramey, only 11, was murdered the night of the 30th, August 1885. Her mother, Rebecca Ramey, was seriously wounded. Gracie Vance and her boyfriend, Orange Washington, were murdered on the night of the 28th, September 1885. Susan Hancock was murdered the night of the 24th, December 1885. Ella Phillips was murdered the night of the 24th, December 1885. Just for a quick understanding of these reports from the past, I'd like to go over a few titles. I'm currently looking at the original papers, or rather, pictures of them. Let's take a look at this first headline. Blood, blood, blood. Last night's horrible butchery. The demons have transferred their thirst for blood to white people. This next one is titled Slain Servants Monday Morning's Horrible Butchery. Innumerable theories, a great many clues, and four arrests. A sickening sight at the scene of the murder. Four poor sons weltering in their blood. Two of them dead and the other unconscious. One rallies and tells the truth. The foul fiends keep up their wicked work. Another woman cruelly murdered and at the dead of night by some unknown assassin 
bent on plunder. Another deed of delivery in crimson catalog of crime. Hey everybody, I hope you enjoyed this. It was a lot of fun to read. I'm going to look more into these murder mysteries like this. Be sure to comment down below and share. I know that's annoying to hear, but if y'all do that and I get a lot of feedback, I'm going to be more motivated to keep making these guys. And I honestly enjoy them. And it seems like everybody else does too, because everyone's always obsessed with murders for some reason. Information I've read today came from Estonia, Austin History Center, and Wikipedia. Thanks to everybody who compiled this information, and feel free to let me know what you think about this guy. Once again, I appreciate everybody for listening. Here's to you, and good night.